Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today I want to start with an overview of uh, model railroad operations. You know, a lot of people have asked me about this over the last couple of years, and so I finally uh, managed to find the time to pull together a lot of the materials that need to go in this. Now, let me point out before I even get started, this is a very broad topic, and as a result, this is a long video, longer than I really wanted to do. So, you know, bear with me, you know, you might want to watch this in two or three sections. I've broken it up into various sections, you know, there's sections on paperwork, on control, communications, and various things like that. And in the future, I'll be coming back and we'll be doing videos showing examples of all of this and how to go about uh, setting up an operating system for your model railroad. But, you know, I can't, comp I can't really compress all of that in to one 30-minute video. Uh, it would take hours to do this. So, you know, that's one of the realities of doing a very, very broad topic like this. Also, this is one of those talking head videos, okay? Uh, I'm just going to be standing here giving you an overview of these various topics. So bear with me on that. We will have specific examples in the follow-up videos over the next couple of weeks. Now, another thing. You might have noticed my voice is starting to fade, and it faded a lot during uh, production of the rest of this video. So I want to warn you of that. It's been very dry uh, here in the house lately, and when that happens, my vocal cords start to dry out, and my voice starts to go. So bear with me. I've tried to make adjustments in processing the video, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to every, uh, understand everything, and it will come across uh, in an intelligible way. But, you know, I can't promise the world. So let's go ahead and move on. So the first thing I want to do, though, is let's define what operations are, because the term is very broad, and um, it means different things to different people. And from my perspective, operations is running trains on a schedule while picking up and dropping off cars in a prototype manner. Now that is a very broad definition and can encompass a wide range of practices. The first thing that you have to decide when you get ready uh, to design and build a model railroad is whether or not you want to follow an actual prototype railroad that might be your favorite, might run uh, near you, uh, whatever, or do you want to do something freelanced or something in between? Uh, because, you know, the, the, it makes a big difference where you're going to, how you're going to do this. Because if you decide to follow a prototype railroad, you have a template on which you can build because they're out there operating. Uh, many of them have been uh, operating for many, many decades. And so you can actually just do a little research on how they operate and then, you know, transplant that into your model railroad. And that's what I did on the Piedmont Southern. I am actually modeling a section of the Southern Railway as it existed in 1957. And so it was fairly easy in my case to go out there. Uh, I paid a visit and drove the entire length of that section of the, uh, of the main line between Lynchburg, Virginia and Charlottesville, Virginia. And I did a lot of research on uh, the history of the uh, railroad in that area, how it operated. Uh, I acquired actual employee timetables and schedules and uh, operating manuals. So I was basically able to replicate what they had been doing uh, in that area uh, over the last hundred years and basically transplant that to uh, the design of my model railroad, the Piedmont Southern. And that even went as far as using their schedules and the like and just modifying them to fit uh, the distances and towns that I chose to model. Now one other thing I want to point out is there's a lot of very good reference material available on how to design a model railroad uh, for operations, uh, about how to set up operations, and how to operate a model railroad, just like the prototype. And uh, let me begin by pointing to one book in particular uh, by John Armstrong, uh, 
track planning for realistic operation. And although John Armstrong has been dead for a number of years now, this book is still available from uh, Kambach. It looks a little bit different than this. They've put a new cover on it and it's in a different edition. But this book, I think, has been in publication since about 1964. And so this is a great book for, you know, building in prototype practices into your model railroad from the get-go. Another very good resource is this book here. Uh, this is Realistic Model Railroad Operation from Kambach. It's written by Tony Custer. And uh, this is, again, this is the first uh, edition of it. There's a second uh, edition that was uh, released, I believe, in 2013. I looked on the uh, Kambach website and could not find this book. However, uh, if you go to the Barnes & Noble website, you can order uh, a copy there. Sometimes they have print versions. Um, they, have a, um, uh, they have a digital version that you can use uh, with their Nook app on your iPad, for example, and other devices. And that's, I have a copy of that one. And this, I tell you, this is the book that I consider probably the most useful for, uh, for people who are getting into operations. Another one, uh, and let me get my iPad open for this one because I only have the digital version of it. Okay, so this was a special edition of Model Railroader, and it's how to operate your model railroad. And I think this is a very good uh, introductory type publication. And uh, it, you know, it, it, it contains a lot of articles uh, that occurred in, or that were published in Model Railroader, and a very good series on the, called The Operators that Andy Sprandio wrote. Very, very good uh, publication. So I recommend this one highly. Uh, check the Kambach Books website and you can order the print copy or you can order a uh, digital version that you can put on your iPad or your computer, whatever. Okay, so there's that one. Finally, what might be considered the Bible is this one right here. Uh, a Compendium of Model Railroad Operations from Design to Implementation. And this uh, book here was published by the NMRA Operations Special Interest Group, OPSIG, and you can purchase it from them, but you can also get this from Streamline Backshop. And that's where I purchased this one. And it is, uh, it, it, it's extensive. It runs to almost 300 pages and it's just packed full of information on every aspect of operations. So if you really want to get wet, this is one way to jump in into the deep end of the pool because there's a lot of good information here. And I will put all of this information and potential sources for it in the description uh, that accompanies this video. Okay, let's go ahead and move on and start talking about some of the things that go into prototype operations. I want to ask you to take a second to subscribe. Click on the subscribe box and when that comes up, click on the little bell right next to it and click all. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on into uh, a look at some of the things that make up prototype operations as practiced uh, on model railroads. Because, you know, you really may not want to get involved deeply in all aspects of prototype operations. Because to be honest with you, there is a lot of paperwork involved in railroading. And I know people that are very, very much into uh, replicating every aspect of prototype operations. You know, they get down to the very basics of creating all of the paperwork, all of the forms that are used to regulate trains and car movements and, and all of that. And uh, I also uh, operate on layouts that use absolutely the bare minimum of paperwork. And you can go anywhere in between and still be happy that you are to some degree replicating prototype practices uh, in your operations. So what does that entail? Well, first of all, uh, in the definition I said that you were running trains on a schedule. And so that involves developing a timetable of some sort. Uh, it allows the uh, dispatcher and the train crews and everybody involved to know where they should be at a given point in time. Schedules were something that were developed quite early in railroading because it was a, the only way that they could safely move uh, two or more trains on the same tracks at the same time without having 
two trains trying to occupy the same space at the same time. And so scheduling trains on a schedule, on a timetable, allowed you to spread them out and keep them from running into one another. The other thing that is very important as part of, of uh, operating a freight railroad are waybills. These are the paperwork that was used to track uh, cars and shipments and, and the like uh, all over the railroad. So waybills are a very important part of the paperwork involved. And I'll show you right here. This is a car card and a waybill uh, along with it. And this is, uh, I'll talk more about this later, but this is a, uh, a car card and waybill system that uh, has been used uh, since about 1960 uh, for model railroading. Paperwork, therefore, is a very important part of railroading and therefore of model railroading. There have been a lot simpler methods used and are still uh, in use, others that have fallen beside the wayside. For example, in the 1960s, something that came about was called a, a tack on a car. And it was literally a little metal thumbtack that had different colors painted on it, which corresponded to the towns on the railroad. And then there might be a number in each one of those color areas that indicated which industry. So you would uh, drill a little hole in the roof of your car and then the thumbtack would just rest in that hole. And it just went along for the ride. And so your operators could just glance down and see where that car needed to go. And there's been a lot of other different systems to varying degrees, they replicated some aspect of, of, of how the uh, railroads um, moved cars around because they kept track of the cars and they actually routed them in a prototype fashion. Now, another important part of all this paperwork is the concept uh, espoused by uh, Alan McClellan on his Virginian and Ohio Railroad. And uh, that was that his model railroad uh, existed as part of a regional and national train network. And so he was constantly, you know, developing ways to make it appear to operators on his model railroad that cars were coming and going uh, off of the model railroad to other uh, cities and yards and other railroads throughout the United States and Canada. So that uh, you didn't feel like all you were doing was just shuffling cars around between one town and another and one industry and another on your model railroad. Cars were actually coming and going from your um, area of the country to other areas of the country. And it, it, that involves a lot of knowledge of uh, various practice of other railroads and industries uh, throughout the United States and different products, all of that kind of thing. Now, as I, as I suggested in my introductory comments, one thing that you can do uh, is use employee timetables and operating manuals uh, to develop your philosophy and approach for your model railroad. And this allows you to set up uh, prototypical schedules. And we'll go over that in a subsequent video of how you go about setting up a schedule on a model railroad. This also requires you to come up potentially with some sort of a timing mechanism. And model railroaders have been doing this, you know, since before uh, World War II, where they have been using uh, clocks with their schedules to actually move trains along over the model railroad following that time schedule. So for, for, for many decades, modelers have been using what are called fast clocks, where they tinker with the mechanism in some fashion or another to make the clock run a lot faster than it normally would. So instead of a 12 hour session uh, on your uh, model railroad taking 12 hours, it might only take three hours or four hours, something like that. So that you get the feeling that time really is passing quite quickly. And the, the interesting thing with that is it works in with the fact that we have to compress space a lot on our model railroads. So if we compress time along with it, then it gives the appearance or the feeling in your mind that time and space are working together at the, in the same way and spreading out your model railroad and making it feel like you're going a lot further in between towns because it's taking you a lot longer than the real clock would tell you it is. Now, if you really don't want to get into that kind of operations, you can use something called sequence operations where you just have a list of trains and 
you know, you start with maybe five at the beginning of an operating session, uh, all going out at the same time. And then as each one co it completes its job, the next one on the list is released and it goes out and does its job. So you just have this sequence of trains running one after the other. And you don't have to worry about following a schedule and having a time clock and that kind of thing. And we'll look at how that works very well for small model railroads. Another type is called a CTC. And what that involves is having a dispatcher at a central location who can communicate with the station agents. Uh, and now, uh, nowadays in modern times, they can uh, con uh, communicate directly with train crews. But in the past, they used to relay orders uh, to the crews through station agents who would write the, 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 the dispatcher's orders down and then hand them up to the crews as they passed uh, that station. And um, he also had control over the signals on the, or on the railroad and also on the, of the switches themselves. And so he could control, you know, whether a train had a green signal or a red signal and whether or not a switch was set for them. He had complete control that way. And it was a very efficient, it is a very efficient system of operating railroads. Central to all of this and to, you know, schedule operations is that railroads had to depend on a uh, system of clocks that were all synchronized so that at any given point the dispatcher would know where every train on his uh, section of the railroad should be. And every employee had to have a uh, railroad approved watch that was synchronized to one of these railroad uh, clocks in yards and, and, and in depots and in, uh, and, and in various stations all along the right of way. So when an employee came into work, he would check his watch against the company clock, and then the rest of the day, the engineer, the conductor, they would all be synchronized with company time. Okay, so that's sort of a broad brush look at, at you know, some of the things involved. And in order to get this all to work properly together, I feel that is, it is really best to plan your operations before you even get started with designing your modern railroad because there are a lot of things that you're going to need to include on the model railroad that are going to be dictated by what you want to do as far as operations go. Because, you know, if you want to replicate the fact that your railroad is part of a major regional and national uh, system, then you're probably going to want at least one staging yard out of sight, you know, behind a wall somewhere, under the layout, where trains can come and go off of the model section of the railroad. And that's what they exist for. Staging yards basically are there so you can pack away a lot of trains and cars, but also so that they can be a place where trains go to off of your particular layout. Here on the Piedmont Southern, I've just modeled between Charlottesville, Virginia, and Lynchburg, Virginia. But I have a staging yard that represents Washington, D.C. Uh, area and all of the Northeast and, and the like. And then I have another yard that represents uh, Atlanta and all areas south and west of there. So that allows me to route cars uh, onto my uh, model railroad from other locations uh, outside of the, uh, that area in Virginia and also to route freight from my industries and towns to other areas of the country as well. A very important part of the design aspect is defining the time period uh, and the control method that you're going to use. Uh, because, you know, if you're modeling something in the 30s, there were very few railroads who were using uh, centralized traffic command. The Southern Railway, for example, did not fully implement CTC until the mid-1960s. So, since I modeled 1957, in order to follow prototype practices, I don't use CTC. I use timetable and train order operations. Another thing you have to be uh, aware of before you start designing your layout are things like specific industries. Do you want to model a lot of pulpwood operations? You know, in central Virginia where I model, it was a big industry. So I wanted to have at least a pulp uh, loading track on just about every uh, spot possible on the Piedmont Southern, which is what I've done. And that also, uh, you might want to do that with quarries, with mines, uh, with, say, a dock operation, whatever. 
you're going to need to do all of the planning up front in order to replicate that type of operation. Um, this also defines to a certain degree the needs for certain tracks and certain car types. For pulp wood operations, I need to have uh, pulp wood flats uh, or gondolas that would be designated for uh, carrying pulp wood. So to wrap that up, it really is best to design it in advance. Do not go ahead and just build a model railroad based on some track plan you like and then think, well, how am I going to operate this thing? And what industries are here? What can I do in order to make this thing actually work right? Okay, let's take a, a quick overview look at train operations. Now, right off, you know, there's a difference between modern uh, train operations and historically. So let's take a look at passenger operations first. And in the modern era, you've got Amtrak, you've got VIA in Canada, and you've got the various railroads uh, in the UK and other places around the world that continue to provide passenger uh, train service uh, in the country. There are also regional commuters that you could add in, as well as tourist and, and uh, excursion trains on the railroad. In uh, the US in pre-Amtrak days, you know, we had our first class streamliners, which were the classy, best equipped and fastest running trains. And then you would have the second class trains, which were, you know, another step down. They might have more stops and uh, taking passengers and dropping them off, but they were still pretty fast trains. Uh, they might have a mixture of modern and older heavyweight equipment as well. And then finally, you would have your locals, which were, you know, stopping at just about every station, picking up passengers, dropping them off, picking up mail and dropping it off, and uh, freight as well. Um, also, back, you know, in that time era, we had a lot of commuter trains running uh, out of major cities. So that would be another practice that you could implement. And finally, there were the mixed passenger trains, which were on uh, small branch lines that didn't carry either a lot of freight or passenger traffic, you might have a combination of freight cars and one coach tacked on at the rear. Or in some cases, they had special cabooses uh, tacked on at the rear that had seating for passengers. So that's one way to include a passenger and freight operation on a lightly used branch line. The big thing, of course, is freight operations. And that can be some of the most interesting for modern railroaders. And there were a number of different classes. There were your symbol or your fast freight uh, trains, which carried, you know, very, very high priority um, merchandise. It might be produce, things of that nature coming from California or from Florida in the winter months. And they were uh, very high priority trains that moved on very fast schedules with few stops. And then you might have the next class down would be the through freights. And they were similar to a fast freight. They might not be carrying as high a uh, priority merchandise, and they might make more stops along the way. Then you might have your turns. A turn was basically an out and back operation. So it would originate, say, in a yard, go out to a specific industry or interchange track, do its work, and then return to the yard. Finally, there were the uh, locals or way freights. And these were really the workhorses of the railroad. They would you know, travel a certain length of track, stopping at every industry and depot along the way, picking up and dropping off cars. Uh, then there were specialized things like mine runs and quarry runs. Okay, let's talk about different types of control systems because control systems were something very important, developed quite early in, in order to prevent accidents from occurring and allow you know, trains to coexist without running into each other. And basically, the first uh, system that really uh, uh, was of importance was what's called a manual block system, where the railroad uh, was divided into blocks of a given length, and it might be a single track section, and there would be signals at the, at the entrance, and there were various mechanisms for determining whether or not a train had authority to enter a block at any given time. This was followed uh, during the early part of the century by uh, automatic block control. And this involved an electronic system with batteries and relays and signals uh, up and down at the entrance to each one of these blocks. 
and the, uh, they had an electronic system where um, it could detect when a train was operating within that block of track. And if a train was in there, then it would automatically flip a relay and a red light would appear uh, on the signals and prevent other trains from entering that block. And then when that train cleared the that block, then the relay would trip, the green light would go up, and you could get enter that block. And that was used for many, many years. It was used on the Southern Railway section that I model up until the mid-1960s. So I am implementing an automatic block control system on the Piedmont Southern. And then finally, as I've said earlier, the, I think in the 1930s, CTC came into, into use on a few railroads, and that you know, greatly increased the safety measure and margin and the ability of railroads to actually move many more trains across the railroad because, you know, you had one person controlling uh, the movement of every train within a given uh, division of the railroad. And, you know, you can design this in. You could use JMRI has a uh, section called Panel Pro that allows you to build uh, uh, control panels right on your computer and they can be used to control the turnouts on your layout so that you can have a virtual control panel right there where uh, you can uh, route trains and uh, control them, control signals and switches. Now another is track warrant control where the dispatcher can be in direct radio contact with the train crews and give them orders and route them uh, through his section of the, uh, of the country. And finally, there's a, a system called direct traffic management, and that uh, is used very, uh, very often by model railroaders. It involves having a magnetic panel with a diagram uh, of your layout, and you use little magnets with train numbers on them to keep track of where every train is on the layout, and you communicate with your train crews to safely move them across the, uh, across the layout. Actually, Micromark sells a kit for making up these uh, uh, magnetic control panels. Now, one thing I've mentioned frequently is the fact that uh, communications is very important as part of operations. Uh, in earlier days, that meant the dispatcher would communicate with the station agents uh, scattered across the uh, railroad and give them orders, which would be transmitted to the train crews as they came through the station. Another, op another way of, of handling this is with radios. The railroads had radios installed in the cabs of many uh, locomotives, but those were typically short-range type of things for communicating uh, um, between the engineer and the conductor and the crew back in the caboose, that kind of thing. The, the, it was not a long-distance communication approach, so that is something you need to think about in planning for your operations. What kind of communications are you going to use uh, between your dispatcher and your train crews. One way to do that is using an intercom system. And you can, you can purchase uh, intercom systems and office phone systems uh, from uh, suppliers on eBay and also on Amazon and, you know, at your local big box stores. Very often sell these. Uh, you can use old telephone uh, handsets, for example, to set up telephone communications. And uh, more recently, something that's become readily available, and I'll provide information uh, on this, are using old style handsets, the candlestick phones, the scissor phones that you often see in use in pictures of dispatchers that were used well up into the 60s. And uh, I have such a system here on the Piedmont Southern. I wrote about how to build that in my book, uh, Wiring Projects for Your Model Railroad. And uh, it works very, very well. It was designed uh, by an ex-telephone company employee and uh, is sold by uh, the company that he is part of. And uh, it does a very, very good job of utilizing those old telephone handsets to create a very good uh, communication system. And I'll be showing you uh, that in a later video. We've got a lot of other videos to come. I've covered a lot in this introduction to model railroad operations. Uh, hopefully, uh, it whets your appetite for what's to come, because I'm planning on at least three more videos on you know developing the paperwork and the operating scheme, developing all of the car cards and waybills, 
as well as communications and block signaling. We've got a lot to cover with this and uh, hopefully uh, this will make sense uh, to you or down the road it will start to make sense as I get into some of the details and show you how I'm implementing it here on the Piedmont Southern. And then finally, uh, at some point, we're going to do a wrap up where I will show you how to implement a sequence operating scheme on the modules that I've been working on for a number of months now. So in the meantime, take care, have a great weekend, and we'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.